Well, this morning we have the delight of entering the last three chapters of Matthew's Gospel. If you'd open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. <clears throat> Matthew 26. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 5 this morning. Matthew 26, 1 through 5. Let's stand together. Let us give our hearts attention to the inspired and infallible Word of God. <clears throat> and it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, He said unto His disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people under the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading of His Word. Let's remain standing as we unite our hearts in prayer. <clears throat> we come before Thee, O Heavenly Father. I trust with joy, with thanksgiving with hearts overflowing with love and praise Lord as we have sung adoration Lord teach us to adore many of us haven't the foggiest notion what that means oh father may we learn by thy spirit's guidance and by the light of thy holy word to exalt thy holy name to praise thee in thy glory for who and what thou art and for thy mighty works among the children of men oh how we praise thee this morning lord i pray that thy people's joy and delight is to be in thy presence, to magnify thee. Lord, we are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. We believe, O oh head of the church, that thou art here and with all of thy candlesticks across this world. Help us to shine brightly the glories of this gospel of grace and of the Holy Christ. O oh God, may thy people's heart be kindled to such a love that their hearts are drawn out of their self-worship, that our hearts are drawn away from the things of this world. And Lord, that we would magnify thee, that we would glorify that we would lift thee up, that thou wouldst increase and that we would decrease. Holy Father, please, we thank thee for the food that fills us, the, the clothing that covers us. We thank thee that in this heat we may meet in a, 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 a place that is cooled, But Lord, most of all, we thank Thee where Thou hast granted new hearts and life eternal. Sins washed away in the blood of Christ. Oh, my Father and my God, 
I pray for the lost in this congregation this morning. And I pray, righteous Father, that Thou wouldst come in that great grace that opens the heart, that convicts of sin, that troubles the soul until it finds rest in Christ. Do it, Father. Send Thy Spirit. Send Thy Spirit. Pour out Thy Spirit here. I do pray that we have all come in the expectation that Thou wouldst do so. Now, righteous God, we come to the preaching of thy word. Lord, I can do nothing without thee. Please help me to handle thy word in a way in which I can give account before thee in that great day. Father, what weakness is in this vessel. Father, I pray that thou wouldst preserve thy dear children, that they would hear thy truth, that they would believe and engage with thee by thy truth. May the Spirit of God overflow in our hearts, and may we truly hear the lover of our soul. Say unto our souls, O God, I am thy salvation. Let us hear thee this morning. Now bless and build up thy people. And may all that we do bring thee joy. Father, we do remember the sick ones in our congregation. Many continue, O oh Lord, to wrestle with this thing that's going around. We have brothers and sisters who have conditions that linger and weaken them. Oh God, have mercy. In light of all this, Lord, <clears throat> We ask most of all that thou, O great physician, would come and heal souls here today. Wounds received because of faithful service to thee. Pour in gospel balm. Lord, those struggling hard with sin, feeling the power of remaining sin in the flesh. O God, Build up thy people today. Now we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The sacred words that we have just read present us with the most important transition in Matthew's story of Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, verse 21, we learned that the angel of the Lord said to Joseph in a dream, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. From that moment, all of Matthew's gospel has been unfolding to this transition. The entire stream of what has poured forth from Matthew's pen, inspired of God's Spirit, has brought us to this transition. <clears throat> because it takes us into the place where we learn how Jesus saved his people from their sins. All of the Gospels, all four Gospels, 
have what we might call an extended introduction to the trial, the crucifixion, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have reached that point in Matthew's wonderful book. Consider what we've learned <clears throat> thus far. Beginning in chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 4, verse 16, we were introduced to the glorious person of Jesus Christ, the God-man. Chapter 4, verse 17, through chapter 16, verse 20, told us of Jesus' declaration of the kingdom of heaven. Repent! Well, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And his inauguration of the kingdom. Manifested by his teaching and miracles. In chapter 16, verse 21, to chapter 28, verse 20. Detail Jesus' journey to Jerusalem and his accomplishing the salvation of his people from their sins by his death and resurrection. This is what the gospel is about. This is what the whole Bible is about. The person and work of Jesus Christ in the redemption of souls. So as we enter chapter 26, we have arrived at the threshold of the most important chapters in Matthew's Gospel. The accomplishment of God's eternal purpose of salvation for all His eternally loved people. Now in these last chapters of this magnificent Gospel, we will see Christ's betrayal, his trial, his torture, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his great commission. In other words, we will see how Jesus saved his people from their sins and then he will send his disciples to tell all the nations of the world the good news of salvation by faith in the crucified and resurrected Savior. Now with that in mind, the scene that Matthew sets before us begins with Jesus predicting his death and then focuses on his enemies plotting his death. Prediction and plotting. These inspired, infallible words set the stage for all that follows. And that is the salvation of God's people and the advancement of God's kingdom. <clears throat> the supreme irony about all this the supreme irony is that the Son of God created the Jews the Son of God preserved the Jews the Son of God was the fulfillment of God's promise to the Jews and yet now the Son of of God will suffer death by the Jews. The faithless apostate leaders of the Jews will aggressively and mercilessly plot Jesus' death. They will not quit until he hangs upon a cross outside of Jerusalem. This is their goal. And yet, 
in their demonic hatred of Jesus Christ and their utter contempt for Him and His ministry, their murderous hearts will accomplish under the sovereign hand of God the salvation of all God's people. Our message is therefore entitled, The Heart of Christless Religion. <clears throat> How is it that the Christ will be nailed to the cross of Calvary? Christless religion. And may our gracious Heavenly Father grant us an unclouded vision and vibrant, saving faith in Christ through the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so our, our first major thought this morning is this. Jesus finished all His teaching and then predicted His death. This is verses 1 and 2. Now let me preface what I'm going to say with this. Chapter headings help us find our way through the Bible. For that, we are grateful. We're happy to be able to navigate the Scriptures. However, those same helps often break the sacred author's train of thought and ours. Even if it doesn't break the author's train of thought, it does ours. We see new chapter and our minds sometimes just blank and wait for something new. And that's indeed a mistake. Most in most of Scripture, especially here, <clears throat> we naturally assume that one chapter is finished and then we start the new chapter as if there were no connections. Fresh thoughts. And that's not good reading of the Scriptures. It's unfortunate because to miss the astonishing connection between chapter 24 and 25 to the transition, verses 1 through 5 here, is a great loss. <clears throat> Let us consider together what is revealed in this brief text. Jesus concluded His public teaching, His public teaching ministry, with His fifth and last discourse. It's the first part of verse 1. <clears throat> the text says, and it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings. Now, <clears throat> we need to be honest with ourselves. <clears throat> we usually read right over little things like that. We want to get to the action. Uh, very often, unfortunately, whether we would say it or not, this tends to be kind of uh, maybe a little text filler, a little extra grammatical stuff thrown in for the big ideas. Very often, that's a serious and mistaken way of thinking. <clears throat> Those words reveal a pattern that Matthew, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, established throughout this gospel. Many of you have not been here as long as we have been in this book. But this goes back to the early chapters of Matthew's inspired gospel. Matthew recorded five major blocks of Jesus' teaching. And whenever our Lord completed one of those major discourses, Matthew followed it with 
that formula. And it came to pass, and then something follows. Every time that we see that, Matthew is giving us something of a transition into another chapter of Christ's life. This is finished. This major discourse has been preached. And now he moves on. Five times this appears in this book. In chapter 7, when Jesus finished the Sermon on the Mount, the text said, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings. In chapter 10, Jesus commissioned his disciples to take the message of the kingdom to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew followed this in chapter 11, verse 1, with, And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples. Jesus then delivered his kingdom parables in chapter 13. And in 1353 we read, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables. In chapter 18, our Savior discoursed about life in the church. The church that he was building. Followed by chapter 19 verse 1. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings. Now there's something different about this last formula. And it's all in one little three letter word. It came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings. All these sayings. Now Matthew is telling us at least three things. Quite likely many more. But he's telling us at least three things. Number one, each time he uses that formula, he is making a transition to another stage in Jesus' public ministry. Number two, in this gospel, Jesus has now finished all his major discourses. And number three, after his resurrection, Jesus will commission his disciples to teach the nations to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Therefore, all of Christ's people, all of Christ's disciples should understand, believe, and walk in the light of what Jesus teaches in these five major discourses. He's just told his disciples, he will tell his disciples, we haven't gotten there yet, but he will tell his disciples, now all this that you've heard, all these things that I've taught you, go out there and teach them worldwide. Now I was brought up that almost all of Matthew is just for the Jews. That's an unfortunate theology. And I think it's tragically a misleading theology. This is for the disciples of Jesus Christ everywhere on this planet. So, Apart from what he says to his disciples, when he establishes the Lord's Supper, Jesus will say little until he gives the Great Commission. In other words, his astonishing teaching, his public ministry of teaching is finished. Jesus then predicted his betrayal and crucifixion again. 
The text says, He said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Now let's remember our context. Jesus is still sitting on the Mount of Olives, talking to his disciples. We didn't change locations because we changed chapters. Jesus has delivered all the content of, Genesis, of chapter 24 and, and 25, and he's continuing to speak to his disciples. Matthew simply wants us to know that with the end of chapter 25, the public teaching ministry is finished. And now, we hear what he is telling his disciples as they sit across from the temple. <clears throat> In chapters 24 and 25, Jesus announced the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple, his second coming, and his presiding as king and judge at the day of judgment. And now he says, this is why that chapter breaks so annoying. Having said he will be the king and judge in that, ex in, in that extraordinary, that astonishing, that overwhelming, that dazzling day. He says, and now in two days I'm going to die. Now, how do you think that struck the disciples? Remember, they hadn't read Matthew's gospel. They didn't have the New Testament. They didn't understand how the story went, though they should have. Christ rebuked them for not understanding how the story went. But now, I will be betrayed and I will be hung on a cross in two days. I will be the great judge. I will be the great king. How, that, how does that possibly work with I'm going to die? Well, that's the whole heart of the matter. That they, and sometimes we, don't understand. Jesus must now go and accomplish the eternal purpose that his father had sent him to fulfill. He is in the stage that theologians call his humiliation. And his humiliation ends in his crucifixion and his body laid in the tomb. Then comes the time that we call his exaltation that begins three days later when he comes out of the grave and then later ascends into glory and sits at the Father's right hand. He will not be coming back for judgment until that cross finishes his life. Jesus is coming, and before he comes again, he took judgment day for his people on that cross. He took the judgment for his people on Calvary. So, since chapter 16, Jesus has been telling them this is going to happen. It isn't just the fact that they haven't picked up on it in the scriptures that they've known since they were children. <clears throat> but he's been telling them verbally, very plainly, what's going to take place when they get to Jerusalem. And since chapter 21, Jesus and the disciples have been in Jerusalem for the Passover. Passover. 
All along, Jesus knew what awaited him in Jerusalem. Torture and crucifixion. Blood and gore. Grief and shame. Mocking and abandonment by his own disciples. In Caesarea Philippi, Peter made his great confession of Christ. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And shortly after that, we read, from that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. That's pretty clear. Later in Galilee, Jesus said, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. He'll sh he shall be raised again. Chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. On the road to Jerusalem, Jesus said, The Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock, to scourge, and to crucify him in the third day. He shall rise again. Each prediction revealed more details about that horrifying event. And it was looming before the Lord on their way to Jerusalem. And now that He is there. Imagine that as he's telling for the fourth time that he's going to die, as he's telling that to his disciples, the city is clearly in view, outside of which in two days he will be tortured and crucified. What love Christ has for his people. So now he says, in two days. We can only imagine as they sat there on the Mount of Olives, what a surreal moment that, that must have been for the disciples. The triumphant coming king and judge will die in two days. He will have all the preeminence. He will have all the preeminence in the stunning glory, beauty, awe, and solemnity of the day of judgment. The glorious Christ on his throne of glory. Millions of angels in all humanity gathered before him. And he will be the preeminent one. Dead in two days. Matthew then quickly switches the scene. It's quite, it's almost abrupt. Christ is announced, I'm going to die. Two days, Passover. Now Matthew reveals that the cursed enemies of Christ plotted his death. Verses 3 through 5. How solemn are these words. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of, of what? <laughs> the high priest who was called Caiaphas, 
and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. By the way, the word then, as Matthew uses it, has quite a bit of elasticity. Very often when we hear then, we think immediately following. Now, that's not what he means here. <clears throat> what he's saying is that this now took place, but he doesn't really put a time signature upon that. So, why does he put these two things together? If you'll stop and think, here's Christ sitting on the Mount of Olives, teaching his disciples about the last thing he's going to teach them before they get to the Lord's Supper and all of those things. This is what I would call Matthew's brilliance, guided by the Spirit of God, Matthew joins the first scene of Christ predicting his death in verses 1 and 2 with the second scene as his scenes plot his death. Matthew, who knows the story, tells us this is exactly why Christ died as far as the earthly participants in God's purpose are concerned. According to Christ's prophecies, everything was right on schedule. Nothing's out of control here. The very sovereign hand of God is moving His Son to the cross of Calvary. His eternal purpose is the salvation of sinners. And it will all take place because of the heart of of Christless religion. Matthew's text bears witness to what was going on beside, behind the scenes. The elders, the chief priests, the scribes of Jerusalem. There's a lot of talk in our day about conspiracies. The death of Jesus Christ was the greatest conspiracy ever has been or ever will be. That's the one you want to be concerned about. You don't want to be on the side of the conspirators. You want to know the living Christ. Well, the curse of God gathered at the palace of Caiaphas in verse 3, the high priest. Why do I call these Jewish leaders the cursed of God? Number one, because Jesus had devastated them with eight woes publicly in the very temple of God. In the presence of thousands upon thousands of pilgrims that were filling Jerusalem to its maximum capacity. In the temple in the house of Almighty God, Jesus said to the leaders, Woe unto you hypocrites! He called them hypocrites that shut themselves and others out of the kingdom. Hypocrites that would receive greater damnation. Hypocrites that were children of hell. Hypocrites and blind guides that were full of extortion, excess, dead men's bones, all uncleanness and iniquity. Hypocrites and blind guides that would not escape the damnation of hell and upon whom all the righteous blood shed on the earth would come. They are indeed cursed of God. Two, because as such, they will be among the goats. 
to whom Christ will say in that last day, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Number three, because we see their ultimate and final rejection of Christ in their satanic plot to murder the Lord Jesus. For there they were in the high priest's palace, the citadel of Jewish leadership. This is not a handful of peripheral cranks of Judaism. These are not the guys bounding in and out of town, hanging out in the caves, uh, uh, taking uh, enlightening drugs and, and making big plots. This is the very heart and soul of Judaism. The Judaism of that day. And they are plotting the death of the Son of God. What are his crimes? Well, he healed the sick. He cast out demons. He touched lepers and made them whole. He raised the dead. And he told the truth. Everybody loved the miracles. What they hated was the truth. Jesus kept telling them their condition. Who wouldn't want to deal with someone who had just laid the eight woes upon you? if you didn't have a heart of repentance. We've got to take this guy out. He makes us look bad. See, this is the heart of Christless religion. I mean, for all of those that decry that religion is the problem of the world, I would agree. But not the faith of Christ. Christless religion often becomes murderous. People like to say, oh, well, look what Rome did. Rome had left the gospel by the time it was burning and killing believers. Brethren, God's people must walk circumspectly because the world takes notice. Now, even if we live exactly the way we're supposed to, somebody will always lie. But the fact is, we need to have a conscience before God that can answer to the scriptures in the day of judgment. Our lives should be circumspect. Now, there are things throughout the history of the Christian church that are tragic, that make us weep, make us grieve that those who wore the name of Christ have done certain things. And I will tell you, we will do similar things unless we stay before God on our faces and walk by grace through faith in the Savior. Be careful that you don't confuse Republicans with guns with Christianity. Not against your concealed carry, and I don't want to know that you have it. <laughs> Brethren, throughout the history of this church, God's people, whenever they walk outside of what God has commanded, Eat the bitter fruits of it. <clears throat> Even we can ape heartless, Christless, religionists. <clears throat> 
if we do not stay on our face in the grace of God. Well, let's talk about Caiaphas for just a few moments because that's where everybody was meeting. <clears throat> they went to the palace of the high priest and here we have the pinnacle or, or the citadel of Jewish leadership. And they've gathered not to worship, but to plot the death of Christ. Caiaphas is known to us in history as Joseph Caiaphas, who was installed in the office of high priest by the Roman financial administrator, Valerius Gratus. I don't know if that is pronounced Valerius. And V's are often pronounced as W's in Latin and vice versa. This office was usually filled on a yearly basis by the Roman officials. In other words, the high priest was essentially a lackey for the Roman government. <clears throat> Caiaphas must have proven to be an exceptional and skillful political force because he held the office between 18 and 19 years. So he was the official head of the Jew, Jewish uh, community and he presided over the Sanhedrin which was the Jews highest court he was extremely powerful second only to the Roman governor we're dealing with a power broker here and the elders and the Sadducees and the, the Pharisees they're all they're all gathering there this made Caiaphas a very wealthy, and he was, religious and political force. They knew who to go to to discuss how to get this thing done. His home was the meeting place for the plot against the Son of God. Next, the curse of God discussed some treacherous way to capture and kill Jesus. The text says, verse 4, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. The word consult here comes from a Greek word mean, that means to engage in joint planning. Well, that's what we see. The verse is a commentary on that to engage in joint planning so as to devise a course of common action, often one with a harmful or evil purpose. Just as a footnote and a little fodder for thought, I wonder how many church splits start just like that. Well, this animosity to Christ is not new in Matthew's gospel. It goes back to earlier days in his ministry. We read in chapter 12, verse 14, when the Pharisees went out, or then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. What had he done to provoke that response? He'd healed a man in the synagogue. What are we seeing? The heart of Christless religion. When Jesus was in the temple, the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables. They perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude. Because they, the multitude, took him for a prophet. These men were not heroes. They were not men's men. In fact, they appear to have been quite cowardly, even though they often were quite brilliant and very gifted men in certain ways. <clears throat> but they want this Christ fellow. They didn't believe, of course, that he was the Christ. They want this Jesus, this guy from the backwater. They want him out of the picture as soon as possible. Now he's not only come down from the regions of Nazareth and Galilee and all of those places that he was 
walking around and, and polluting with his doctrine and his miracles. He said at the heart of Jewishness, the very temple of Jerusalem. And he's speaking God's curses upon the leadership of the Jews. Now they've had enough. And it's all coming together. Finally, the curse of God agreed to avoid arresting Jesus during the feast. This certainly shows that they were sharp guys. Verse 5, the sacred text says, But they said not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Remember, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, depending on who you read, had filled Jerusalem as they did every year at Passover. This was a crowd that, if it turned, would be uncontrollable. There wouldn't be enough army to take care of tens of thousands of people turning in uprising. In, in other words, the, the, the word uproar here uh, usually nowadays get, gets applied to a room full of children or something like that. But the, the idea behind the word is riot. Riot. They said, let's not do this on the feast day because we may have a riot on our hands. We've already learned these are not really courageous fellows or at least it doesn't seem that way. Maybe they were. Maybe there were some of the men that had known of and had been influenced by the Maccabean revolt and maybe there were some strong men here. Whatever the case, they certainly knew that they were outnumbered in the event of a riot. So they said, we're not going to do it then. And everything now that follows from chapter 26 to chapter 28 unfolds from this scene. Everything. We will see a remarkable, remarkable interaction between Christ and his disciples, Christ and the Jewish leaders, even the people that are gathered as Christ stands before them. Brethren, this is what Matthew's gospel is all about. And as we move through these chapters, I pray that you will be in prayer, crying out to God that he will meet with us as we see the final part of Christ accomplishing redemption unfolded before us in the infallible word. Before we finish, let's make a, just a few applications. <clears throat> as we think about what we've just seen, really quite a number of things arise that might be useful for us. But here's, here's the first one that I would encourage you to take in and think about. As the disciples of Christ, if you are here today, you profess to be a disciple of Christ, I believe that this applies to you. We should know and live according to Christ's discourses in Matthew's Gospel. Of course, Jesus' five discourses in Matthew are not all of his teaching. And I don't intend to give you that impression. But there are these five big blocks that Matthew chose by divine direction to set before disciples. Remember, Matthew's gospel is the gospel of discipleship. It is, it is, and as I say gospel there, I mean his book, not the content of the saving gospel. I'm talking about the gospel, the, the life story that he has written of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the gospel of discipleship. From the beginning, Jesus is calling, making disciples, and we see that he ends the book by sending his disciples to make more disciples. Well, what are the, 
the, the disciples supposed to do? Oh, well, here's how it works, right? We send somebody out on the street or we send them door to door or we get a preacher who every week's, week preaches and preaches and preaches to try to get the fish to hop into the net or to bite the line, right? We just tell them, look, uh, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus rose again for you. If you'll just let him save you, uh, you're on your way to heaven. And then don't doubt it. This is not the gospel. It's not biblical evangelism. In fact, it probably makes more goats than sheep. Deluded religionists. One of the problems with our churches and one of the reasons we are so impotent is because we have padded the walls with goats. Not people who have been transformed by the mighty power of God's Spirit. Not people who have repented of their sins and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and are taking up their crosses and following after Him daily. We've got people who've made a decision. And 30 years later, they're still sitting in their spiritual diapers, so to speak, never making a holy grunt and just waiting to kick out the next, kick out the next pastor. The churches have no power because there are so few regenerate souls. We are irrelevant to this culture now. Don't you understand that? We are irrelevant, impotent, laughable. We're hardly distinguishable from them. And when we are, we've just made our own little enclave and we stay away from everybody so that we can be called a cult. No matter how biblical we might be. We are not often the salt and light that God has commanded us to be. And part of that, it's a lot bigger picture, but part of that, my brethren, is because many of us do not even know, let alone live in, these discourses for discipleship. I grew up in a, in a system called dispensationalism. I do not mean to attack all of those who hold dispensational uh, convictions. I do not mean this in any way to be demeaning. I'm just saying in the brand of it that I grew up in, repentance was for the Jews. You don't tell Gentiles to repent. You don't tell New Testament people to repent. You just tell them just to believe. And if they say that they've believed once, then you've got to guarantee them that they're going to heaven no matter how they live. We've got, I, I can't even guess the numbers. I, I even hate to put a number on it. I would say hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people buy that. And then pastors spend all their lives trying to get people to commit themselves. If you're a believer, you are committed to Jesus Christ. You don't need 150,000 sermons on, hey, get committed. Actually, lying at the heart of the word believe is the, the very notion of commitment. If you really believe, you are committed to Christ. If you're not committed to Christ, you're lost. And I call you and I urge you and I plead with you to come to the Savior. And don't just sit there on your Calvinistic duff. Christ was the living Savior who preached and cried out for people to repent of their sins and to follow Him. To follow Him. And if you're following Him, well, how are you supposed to live? Oh, well, you get as close to hell as you can while you're yelling grace. Look at our churches. Brethren, Look, just look. No, you know, people say, oh, wow, you know, all the young people are, are leaving. Let's get a band. How about this? How about we pray and fast until the Holy Spirit falls on us? We need to know what Jesus has told us to do. And Matthew, inspired of Christ's Spirit, puts five big blocks in this book. 
in chapters 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount describes kingdom living in the world. Well, let me ask you, what Christian can afford to be ignorant of that? How many of you could sit here right now and say, oh, well, Sermon on the Mount, yeah, I've, I've been reading that. I've been looking at these things. They have influenced me deeply. I've been walking in these things. I fall on my face a lot. I need the grace of God every single day. I can't do a single bit of this without faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the astonishing copious grace that he gives me every day. But, but yeah, I, I know what he wants us to do. Do we? Do we? In chapter 10, Jesus instructed his disciples on the dangers involved in faithfully preaching the kingdom. What faithful believer can afford to be ignorant of that? Are you aware that if you go downtown and pass out tracts and tell people about the Savior, if you love them in Christ, you come to them with a heart desiring their salvation, and share with them the glories and the beauty of Christ and of the gospel, they may hate you. They may punch your lights out. Do you get this? Most of them aren't going to say, oh, that's nice. Unfortunately, what you'll probably do is run into a lot of the deacon's children down there. You know, I mean, what do we see? When you read this book, when you find those that are faithful with God, you find people in tribulation. You're not going to be American comfortable. And some of the forces that be that are working in our culture right now would really like to see that happen. May God hold them back. May we pray as Paul tells us to in 1 Timothy chapter 2. That we may pray for a quiet and godly lives. I, I like peace. I don't like being hated. I don't like being threatened. I've had people back me up against a car thinking, all right, I'm about to be unconscious. I've had a big old fellow grab me around the head and the neck and drag me uh, a, a few feet, and I thought, tonight I'm going home modified if I make it home. People aren't going to think you're wonderful unless the Lord converts them, and then they will love you. Generally speaking, not till then. We've been taught very often by some of this stuff that comes out of some of our seminaries just to be nice. Whatever you do, just be nice. No, what you and I have to be is holy. And in being holy, what I mean by that is repenting of our sins, trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, and by faith in the Savior, walking in what he's told us. When we do that, our lives are separated from the things of the world. You don't have to go hide in a cave. <sighs> Brethren, this is a vital matter. <clears throat> Stop and think with me for just a few moments. <clears throat> in chapter 18, Jesus gave his discourse on life in his church. Now, what member of Christ's church can afford to be ignorant of that? Do you know how to live in, in the church among God's people? Sure. Show up on Sunday, get out as fast as I can so I can beat the line down at the restaurant. Yeah, I go fishing with the deacons or with the, with the pastors. They're good old boys. And then we have a church split. All right? what, what are we talking about here? That the Lord of heaven and earth has given us commandments and said, walk in these. Here's what it looks like. When you put it all together and you shake it up and the Spirit of God opens your eyes, it all looks like this. Love for God and love for His people. Do you know what the Lord expects of you as a member of the church? Christ tells you a whole lot about that in chapter 18. In chapter 24 and 25, the Olivet Discourse describes Jesus' second coming and urgent warnings to be prepared for the day of judgment. What child of God can afford to be ignorant of that? One that's been put asleep by the wrong teaching of grace that's like spiritual 
anesthetic, spiritual chloroform. Don't worry, it's all of grace. Oh, don't worry, you live like hell, that's okay. You, you, you made a decision, everything's fine. Now this is utterly detestable to the throne of grace. Yes, praise the Lord, all our sins are washed away, all of them. Now and forever, if we are Christ's people, all of them. But that's not a license to live like the world. We need to be prepared for the day of judgment because it is a judgment that begins at the house of God. So what child of God can possibly afford to be ignorant of that? Five big blocks of teaching that prepare us to be the kind of disciples Christ shed his blood for us to be. And you know what? For those that are alive in Christ, they find that his commandments are not heavy, brutal, grit your teeth and just make it through it. They're wonderful. It's real freedom. Let us devour Christ's words to us in these discourses. Let us say with Job, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Let us say with the psalmist, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. If that's true of the Decalogue, what do you think about the Sermon on the Mount? More to be desired than gold. What about all of these discourses? They're, they're words of life. Let us be able to say with Peter, Thou hast the words of eternal life. We have them. You've given them to us. We want to walk in them. You say, well, I'm weak. Good. I'm glad you know that. That means... Trust the Savior. Believe the Savior. Believe. Listen to the scriptures. Paul prayed for the Ephesians, those former pagans. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be filled with might by his Spirit in the inner man. Shouldn't we be praying that for each other? Maybe there would be a difference in the way we lived if we believe that God actually filled his people with might by his spirit and then proved it. Well, Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. May that be the case. But we need to stop. Let me simply mention the last two. As disciples of Christ, as disciples of Christ, we must make our calling and our election sure lest we prove to have the heart of Christless religion. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And those that believe have new hearts, and those new hearts want what Christ wants. Love what Christ loves. Oh, they don't want it as well as he wants it. And they don't love it as much as he loves it. And they learn to hate what he hates. And they don't hate it as much as he does. But it's doable. It's real. When we read this book, it's what we find. God's people can fall into all kinds of messes. They can, fall, they can make unbelievable problems for themselves. That's one of the reasons we have Paul's epistles and Peter's epistles. But why are all those things there? So that we can commiserate and say, oh good, I'm still wicked too. Is that what, is that what they're there for? No. Timothy tells us, Paul tells us through Timothy, Paul tells us as he writes to Timothy, God's words are given for doctrine, for correction. Not so that we can just sit around and say, ah, grace, grace. 
but so that that grace becomes a fire of love in our hearts that draws us to walk after Jesus. As the disciples of Christ, we should love him with all our hearts because of his bloody sacrifice for undeserved sinners. Not a one of us here ought to be any other place right now than in hell. Not one of us, starting right here. So why am I here? Because of the sovereign grace of God. Because he reached down into the cesspool of my life. And he did the same thing with you. He got the gospel to you. Whether you grew up in a Christian family or in a crazy, wild, dysfunctional family, God saved sinners of every stripe. And when we realize who and what we are, we should love him with all our hearts. Can you not love someone fervently that has shown you the greatest love ever known? That he would lay down his holy life that we might live. Well, my brethren, we must stop. <clears throat> Do we see any of the irony that's here in this transition passage as we close? Do we see the irony? Jesus, the coming king and judge, is about to be judged by religionists. The one who will sit upon the throne of his glory from Matthew 25 and its glorious revelation will stand before the throne of sinners. He that is just will receive no justice. He that is the creator of the universe is about to be judged by his creations. He that is life is about to suffer death. He that is love itself will face the hatred of men. He that is truth will suffer lies told about him so that his life is taken away unjustly. From what will these awful contradictions arise? From the heart of Christless religion. We want a religion full of Christ, full of the Lord Jesus, looking to him and his glorious mercy and grace. Let us come to him in repentance. Let us come in faith and let us know the joy of the Lord in the knowledge that all our sins truly are washed away in him. Do not settle for the outward trappings of religion, but be sure that you know and love the altogether lovely one. Amen. Father, we thank Thee for Thy mercy. And now, O oh God, we commend ourselves to Thee and to Thy grace. We look around us and we see a church stumbling and falling, Lord, often vomiting up its culture. I pray with all of my heart that we would see Thy Spirit move through the churches of this land and do a mighty work of cleansing and awakening. And may we bring glory to Thee, Lord. We won't bring a bit of glory to Thee today apart from that marvelous, sustaining grace. Fill us and help us to magnify Thee. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us go in the name of Christ.